Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lecture on Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Odo. As I had promised you that I will make a series of lectures on Waiting for Odo. And I know the introductory section is overdue. I will do that. Presently, I'm dealing with some uh, family issues, some health-based issues. And therefore, it is becoming increasingly difficult for me to continue with the classes. However, the show must go on. And so I will definitely upload all those classes. <clears throat> so you do not need to worry. Today, I propose to deal with <coughs> the character of Kodo. The first thing that I want to deal with is the enigmatic presence of Mr. Godot. Now, who is Godot? If we look at Waiting for Godot, it is a curious mixture of existential theatre, theatre of the absurd, and there are multiple hints of the uh, musical tradition in this play as well. And it is renowned for, for the uh, exploration of the themes such as uh, absurdity, existential angst, the human condition and so on and so forth. However, at the heart of the play, at the core of the play, exists the enigmatic persona of Goto, a character whose elusive presence serves both as the impetus, that is the driving force, and the source of existential uncertainty simultaneously. Therefore, we shall begin our discussion today by exploring the significance, symbolism, uh, and implications of the existence slash non-existence of Godot, both on the state space, on the philosophical praxis, as well as whether any Godot exists, and who is Mr. Godot. So the first point that I would like to make, my dear friends, is about the elusiveness of the character of Godot. Now, I do not need to tell you that Godot is in the least mysterious and enigmatic. He is a mysterious and enigmatic figure who is repeatedly uh, referred to alluded to throughout the course of the play. But sadly, Godot never physically appears on stage. Throughout the play, Vladimir and Estragon are anxiously waiting for his arrival. They are hoping for a script that Mr. Godot will provide that will give them a purpose a sense of being, a sense of living, a sense of existing. They are hoping for a certain, perhaps, uh, salvation or some form of enlightenment that they might receive from this character of Godot. However, Godot remains elusive, leaving both the characters and the audience struggling to grapple with the uncertainty. The uncertainty works on multiple levels. The question does not any longer remain whether Godot will come or not, but whether Godot exists in the first place. So 
the questions regarding his identity, his intentions and his significance remain popped up but unanswered simultaneously. And therefore, the uncanny aura that surrounds Mr. Godot, the elusiveness of Godot, serves as a central metaphor for the human condition, highlighting both the characters existential angst and the futility of their search for the meaning. Now, Godo, in this context, represents an abstract and unknowable force whose absence underscores the absurdity and uncertainty of existence in the first place. And by leaving Godot's identity and intentions open to interpretation, Beckett invites the audiences to grapple with the fundamental mysteries of existence in itself. That is, uh, how do you go for a search for meaning in an indifferent universe? Now, waiting for Godot, I believe there are several opinions regarding this play, regarding the uh, placement of the play in the history of English literature. Some people have called it a postmodern play, some people have called it a play of modernist origins. I believe that waiting for Godot serves as a bridge between modernism and postmodernism. Because waiting for Godot is that because waiting for Godot serves as that bridge which connects the missing link between a quest for meaning and a calm acceptance that meaninglessness is a meaning in itself. And therefore, you see that there is a lot of gameplay, both physical gameplay, psychological gameplay, linguistic gameplay that is being uh, going on in Godot. There is a very famous book called The Games That People Play by Dr. Eric something. I am forgetting his surname. Uh, that's a very interesting book. There he talks about the psychology of games and all. Now, if you look at Godot, Godot deals with the psychology of games. It deals with the psychology of human interaction, human communication, human language and so on and so forth. And the gaps that are there in human language. Now, in such a context, waiting for Godot becomes that welcome bridge between the idea of a modernist, uh, of a quintessential modernist search for a meaning against a backdrop of meaninglessness and the embryo of a postmodernist acceptance that meaninglessness in itself is a meaning. Chaos is an order in itself. So what happens is that I believe Beckett invites his audiences to grapple with these fundamental mysteries. Now, Godot has been interpreted in various ways. Uh, several scholars, critics, they have kept on offering uh, different interpretations of his significance and of his symbolism. The most popular one is Godot is God or a divine figure. That is, he is a representation. And the absence of God reflects humanity's futile search for transcendence and spiritual fulfillment. I hope some of you have heard about a philosopher called Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche 
called for uh, he he beckoned the herald of um, a cult of the death of god he said god is dead one madman comes into the market square and he yells that god is dead we have killed him now does the madman in my reading i believe that nietzsche is not in effect talking about the uh, physical death of god but he is talking about the necessity of god like say imagine this is my phone i still love using such phones uh, i have a smartphone but this is my favorite one i keep it always with me uh, such keypad phones now imagine if this keypad phone suddenly uh, stops working all right i will not go to the phone companies owner to service it right i will rather go to a local shop for the servicing so what happens is that that does not mean that the owner of the phone company is dead it rather means that the necessity of the owner in my life is very little similarly what happens is that as society keeps on changing decentralization happens and therefore the necessity of one centralized power head so as to say becomes lesser and lesser uh, so the it's not that god is dead but that on every occasion his necessity is dead this is my understanding of the text itself i might be right i might be wrong whatever i am uh, but here look when god moves so far away that he becomes a dot just like a star stars are so huge they are uh, huge beyond our wildest imagination <clears throat> like maybe say millions of earths they can be uh, they can be put into a star so a star is that huge and what happens is that despite a star being that huge when it is so far away it looks like a small dot of light it looks like a small blot of light so what happens here my dear friends is that it is not that the star is small but it is so far away that it has become a dot uh there is a poem you know a series of poems uh by rainer maria rilke let me see if i can show you those poems Rainer Maria Rilke the name of the poem is Duino Elegies let me see if i can find the translation give me one second if i can find the duino elegies i'll show you the first one ah the first elegy wait let me quickly share the screen and let us begin um ah here you go who if i cried out would hear me among the angelic orders and even if one were to suddenly take me to its heart i would vanish into its stronger existence for beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror that we are still able to bear and we reserve it so because it calmly disdains to destroy us every angel is terror so this is from rilke's duin legis so my dear friends you can very well understand that the situation over here is very very similar 
although God has gone so far away that he has become a dot, but that does not mean that God is no less powerful. And if you look at it from a religious perspective, if you look at the play from a religious perspective, what happens is that Godot might very well be God because he has the script to their lives. He can give them uh, salvation, the salvation that they are seeking. So it might very well be a viable interpretation that Godot is God. However, Beckett himself denied the idea. He said that if I, if by Godo I meant God, I would have said Godo. I would have said God and not Godo. So what else can be there? Some look at Godo as some authoritarian power, a power that is going to rise. So he is symbol. He is a symbol of authority or power, representing the oppressive forces that govern and control human life. Uh, some see Godo as a new power source, uh, as in a new country which will become the next world ruler. Like back then, America was slowly uh, becoming on the way to become the ruler of the world. So some even believe that Godo is America. <clears throat> but what I believe. So before I come to that, let's look at the etymology of the word Godo. Since I have learned a little bit French here and there, you see, the French have a very interesting tendency of using the suffix OT after every word. The words which they use for India. And so if I have to call someone near and dear to me, I will add the suffix OT to their name. For example, if I am calling somebody Charles, say Charlie Chaplin, so Charles Chaplin. So Charles in French becomes Charles, like Charles Baudelaire. So I will call him Charlo. If I have to call somebody called Pierre, so that person will become Pierre Ho. Because that last T will be silent. So Charlo, Pierre Ho, similarly God would become Godot. And during this time when Beckett was uh, writing, another a person in France wrote a book. The name of the book was Atadidu, Waiting for God. Although present studies have disregarded this idea because they say that Beckett had not read the book, but you can feel that both of them were waiting, that waiting for God was not such a bad idea back then because they had just been through two world wars. France had suffered hugely, very badly. And therefore, in such a situation, waiting for God or denying God, both ideas are not very far-fetched. So, God becomes Godot in this way. Again, the word Godot might have had its origin in uh, the French word Godai or Godas. It might have had its origin in uh, the word for shoe. So what happens is that uh, Godot perhaps had his origin in the word shoe itself. Just like Eliot's proof rock uh, comes from the name of a shop called proof rock Litau. Now, the 
word godo might come from even the verb godai godai uh, is a very uh, godai or godas both the ideas are there now it comes from a family of words like you have goder which uh, means uh, potter about which means mess around which means fooling around something and it has several implications again the source of godo might have been honore di balzac's text mercade it is a comedy in three acts there are several similarities uh, gustave flaubert's bouva de pecouche is considered as one of the precursors to waiting for godo because uh bouvard and pecouche are two characters quite like vladimir and estragon in certain respects so you see godo is not an isolated incident okay uh the fact that beckett created godo uh you see when we look at the french title it's un apava godo while waiting for godo in the english translation it becomes waiting for godo so in the english translation the waiting part becomes major but the french version keeps the actions that are there in waiting for godo that is what are vladimir and estragon doing while they are waiting for godo that becomes important now regardless of what the interpretation of godo is godo serves as a very powerful symbol of existential uncertainty and the human propensity to seek meaning and purpose in a seemingly indifferent universe and his absence underscores the characters existential angst and their desperate search for meaning which highlights the absurdity and poignancy of their predicament now the issue is that is godo really absent he is physically absent but look without any concern consideration consciousness of godo the entire play crumbles apart godo is that fulcrum on which the entire play revolves and therefore this is a very difficult question to answer whether godo is actually present or absent this is a very difficult question my friends let's be very honest with ourselves even in his absence he is present now despite his physical absence godo exerts a profound influence on the other characters in the play and vladimir and estragon anxiously await his arrival hoping that he will give them salvation enlightenment or at least a script to play their own character but you see as i told you the poem by rilke that beauty is terror the angel is terror godo is terror therefore vladimir and estragon are genuinely afraid of godo they are somewhere deep down complacent with their present uh, condition and therefore they are afraid when actually godo appears now vladimir and estragon are waiting for godo's arrival but their interactions are marked simultaneously with a sense of uh, marked by a sense of anticipation and expectation but simultaneously of fear and terror as they grapple with the uncertainty of godo's arrival because you will have to realize that they really do not know what godo has in store or what godo is going to give them or what godo is going to give them whether they like that script or not if they will be forced to take that script etc etc 
so that's the concern that's the consideration that is the problem that is the uncertainty of life we know that we want change but what that change will bring for us that is a different question whether it will be for the better or for the worse we really do not know that now putsu and lucky are another pair of characters who appear in the play and uh references to godo are also made in their context that is this goes on to suggest that godo has uh, or godo holds a position of authority of significance of power over their lives as well potso in particular seems to rely on godo for validation and support because potso establishes his supremacy by saying that godo i have not heard about him do you mean potso so the fact that these uh people vladimir and estragon do not know potso but they are waiting for a certain godo is something that is unacceptable to potso and therefore he says godo i haven't heard about him are you looking for potso so he has to negate godo in order to establish himself so in a way godo has a certain sway over his own life as well <clears throat> now you see the ambiguity of godo becomes very important the ambiguity of godo is one of the most striking aspects in the play because throughout the play beckett offers few clues about godo's identity fewer about his intentions or motivations and in the process he leaves the audiences to speculate about his true nature and this ambiguity allows for multiple interpretations of godo's significance and this leads to the open endedness of the play and it adds to the complexity of an already complex matrix that the play creates now some interpretations suggest that godo may represent the human tendency to seek some external validation or the human desire to seek validation from figures of authority but others have seen godo as a symbol of hope or of salvation i think both are correct but there is a third group they view godo as a manifestation of the external despair or the absolute uncertainty the absurdity of human existence but regardless of the interpretation godo remains a very mysterious and elusive figure whose absence haunts the characters whose absence haunts the play and underscores the existential themes of the play by be, let me put it like this by being absent on stage godo is present and permeates through the audience's mind just like godo is present and permeates through the character's mind okay now as i was saying one interpretation of godo is that he is a symbol of hope and salvation now you might say sir why are you calling mr why are you calling godo a he because vladimir and estragon are waiting for a certain mr godo you might think of him in as abstract terms as you want i have no issues with that even i myself think of godo as in abstract terms but since beckett's characters call him a he a mr godo i am for the sake of reference at least for the time being calling him a he now godo is a symbol of hope of hope and salvation and throughout the play vladimir and estragon cling to the belief that godo will arrive and offer them some form of redemption and purpose 
and they express a sense of anticipation and expectation one second uh yes they express a sense of anticipation and uh, a sort of longing eagerly awaiting the arrival of godo as a source of a recluse as a source of relief from their existential burden from their existential despair if we look at the text like this then godo represents the human desire for meaning and connection in a seemingly indifferent universe this is a very positive reading of the play he embodies uh, the hope the salvation that may just be around the corner and this offers a glimmer of light in the darkness of the character's existence just opposite to it just the 180 degree reading of it would be that godo serves as a metaphor for the futility of human existence <coughs> is throughout the play <coughs> godo only promises to appear but never does sunil gangopadhyay has a a uh, poem a very beautiful poem it is in bengali the name of the poem is keu kotha rakheni nobody kept his word let me share the poem with you i will translate i will translate extremely sorry some advertisements are there let me share the poem ah here it is i'm extremely sorry some advertisements are coming up आगमनी गान हटात थामे शुक्ला द्वशीर दिन अंतरा टुकु सुनिए जाए कत चंद्रभु कमस्या चले गल कई बोष्टुमी एलो ना Pochish bachor apekhayachi, and then he keeps on talking about uh, the kind of promises that have been broken. And in the last line, the uh, last line he says, "Keu kotha rakhe ni the trish bachor katlo keu kotha rakhe na." So nobody kept his word. It has been thirty-three years. Nobody kept their words. Like when I was a child, a young uh, Boshtumi is a a lady who sings. She is a spiritual lady who sing who sings. So she came uh, to their house and she was singing a song and she promised that she will come later and. sing the last part of the song the last stanza maybe after that so many years have passed neither did that ghost to me come nor did the poet hear the last lines so he is still waiting after 25 years and then says nobody kept their words so look godo does not keep his words no yeah. every day he promises that he will come tomorrow but he does not come but throughout the play godo's absence therefore serves as a constant reminder of the character's own vulnerability and insignificance if they really had any significance they would have stopped waiting for godo and moved on they even propose to move on but cannot but despite their endless waiting godo never arrives at least not within the ambit of the play and this leaves vladimir and estragon trapped in a circle a cycle of uncertainty and despair so look in this representation in this interpretation godo represents the existential void 
at the heart of human existence, which highlights the absurdity and meaninglessness of life. That is, Godo is something negative. Godo is that ever elusive horizon which we shall never be able to attain. Godo is that promise which is never meant to be fulfilled. His elusive nature reflects the character's futile attempts to find meaning and purpose in a world that is devoid of any inherent value. Where we have systems, but those systems do not yield any results. There is a third interpretation of what Godo might signify. <clears throat> this third interpretation views Godo as a symbol of authority and power. In the play, Vladimir and Estragon referred to Godot's supposed authority, eagerly awaiting his arrival and seeking his approval. So therefore what happens is that Godot's absence reinforces his position of power, highlighting the character's subservience and dependence on external forces. Look, the way that things are, I really do not know. It will be extra textual material. But nonetheless, let me put this question before you. Do you think, let me ask you this. Please give your answer in the comment section. Do you think that Godot would have waited for even one minute for Vladimir and Estragon. Vladimir and Estragon, as I have sh showed you, it's a horizontal plane. They are equals. Lucky and Puzo are like a vertical plane. They are in the power dynamics of master and slave. But Godo is the tangent which influences all these characters. But do you really think, tell me your honest opinion, give me your honest opinion in the comment section. I will wait for it. Uh, do you really think that Godot would have waited a second for Vladimir and Estragon? Just like they were waiting for him. I uh, wanted, to, when I was a student, Godot was there in our syllabus. Waiting for Godot was there in our syllabus when we were students of master's degree. And I remember I once started writing a play during my master's called uh, Waiting for Nowhere. And the storyline of that play was something like this. I finished that play but never staged it or did anything with it. I don't know if I have the copy with me right now either. It has been so long ago, 2013 maybe. <clears throat> so I was writing a script called Waiting for Nowhere. And there the storyline was something like that. Uh, Godo is waiting in a taxi the first evening. The city is very crowded. He has promised two persons called Vladimir and Estragon. Uh, that he will meet them. His phone is not working and there is a very poor signal where they are in the village area and what happens is that since it's a country road and <clears throat> Godo is waiting for the traffic to clear so that he can arrive and meet those two people. However, suddenly another call comes up and Godo picks it up and says, all right, all right, I'll be there. And he calls up one of his regional office people. And um, he says that the rival company of the of the Italians led by a certain Mr. Pozzo will throw his clients off. So 
Godot is uh, referring to his zonal company to inform those people that go and inform them that I will not be able to come today. I'll come tomorrow. I'll certainly come tomorrow, but not to talk to the Italians. Because they are just there to kind of disrupt the entire thing. And the company manager is so very busy dealing with his daily work that he sends an office boy to meet with Vladimir and Estragon. Now, Godo is back in his work. A few days later, he remembers that he has to go and meet them. So this time, he does not take a taxi. He takes a train and he decides to take a horse carriage to meet them. And the same thing happens. He gets a call and he cannot go. So I wrote a play like this. But as uh, Akash said in the comment section right now, I also don't think that Godot would have waited one second for these people. That was my interpretation of waiting for Godot, that I was uh, waiting for nowhere, that I was writing a play. That's a different storyline. So my professor, when he saw that play, he said that, um, change the names, Devarko. Don't keep those names. Because the interpretation that you are giving of Beckett, it does not, it does not uh, do justice to waiting for good. You are creating a different version. You are creating a parallel version of what would have happened had Godo actually appeared. But he said something very interesting. He said, do you really think Godo exists? And that made me think, what if these people are actually hallucinating? Because they are two tramps. The tramps were uh, becoming very, very uh, common at the uh, towards the end of the uh, post uh, towards the end of the Second World War because the economy was absolutely destroyed. The European economy was absolutely destroyed by the uh, two world wars, and the tramps were growing in number. And soon you will see the emergence of the hippie culture. So in such a situation, these uh, this play has a very uh, different connotation and a very different context. Back then, I did not understand so much, so I wrote what I wanted to write, whatever. So, in a way, you can look at Godo as a psychological construct at wishful daydreaming of these two people as well. So, you are free to look at Godo the way you want to look at him. Now, as I was saying that Godot, uh, let's come back to my question that Godot is in a power position because he can give them salvation, he can give them significance, he can do a lot of things. So in this interpretation, Godot represents the oppressive structures that govern human society, whether it be the political regimes, the religious institutions, social hierarchies, the uh, crypto market, the share market, the uh, conglomerates that are running society right now. But his elusive nature serves as a reminder of the arbitrary uh, nature of power and the ways in which power coagulates in certain places. The ways in which power can be used to control and manipulate others. That is a very interesting way of looking at it. But you see, there is a fourth way of looking at it. That is, another interpretation is that Godot is a reflection of the audience's own expectations and desires. That is, throughout the play, Vladimir and Estragon project their hopes and fears onto Godot. And thus they imbue Godot with qualities and characteristics that reflect their own inner struggles. 
if we look at godot like this then godot becomes a mirror for the audience's own existential dilemmas and this invites them to confront the uncertainties and the contradictions of their own lives therefore by keeping the identity of godot ambiguous beckett deliberately allows the audiences to project their own interpretations onto him making godot a deeply personal and subjective figure so my godot is different from your godot and x is godot y is godot z is godot etc etc so on and so forth so there are multiple godots and you know let me uh, stretch this argument a little as you travel through life you will see that you want 10 things in life na no? one thing is very important the second thing is a little less important the third thing is a little less important but we want 10 20 100 things in life but simultaneously we want those things just like we want them there are certain things regarding which we are not ready to negotiate there are certain things which no matter what we get we are happy and there are certain things where we can sit and negotiate the terms a little if godo is our own expectations then we can say this that there are many godos around us but perhaps we are looking for the godo that our heart desires say if somebody is looking for money in life money uh, maybe a good house maybe a nice looking car maybe say those markers of social success if that person gets something like uh, say 10 crore rupees then his godo is achieved but instead of that money instead of that economic support if that person say gets love that person's heart will never be fulfilled because that person is not really looking for love right now and on the other hand imagine another person who is desperately looking for love desperately looking for companionship and that person is earning a lot so despite maybe having three houses 10 cars 20 uh, lavish parties a month that person will not be happy because that person does not have love does not have companionship just like one famous bollywood movie dialogue was mere paas gaadi hai bangla hai sab kuch hai tumhare paas kya hai and the other guy says mere paas ma hai so i have cars bungalows and etc etc what do you have and the other guy says i have mother so just like that we are all looking for godo but our godos are different and there are multiple godos surrounding us but not perhaps the godo that we are looking for and finally some interpretations of godo view him as an absent presence that looms large over the play despite the physical uh, absence that is throughout the play godo's name is invoked repeatedly serving as a constant reminder of his impending arrival yet despite his absence godo exerts a powerful influence over the characters and the events of the play and in this interpretation godo represents the unseen forces that shape the human existence whether in the form of fate destiny cosmic interference cosmic indifference cosmic influence whatever you call it his presence or his absence that is his presence or his lack thereof underscore the character's sense of existential uncertainty and it heightens their futile attempts to find meaning in a world that is absolutely beyond their control so therefore it is very very difficult to pinpoint exactly who is godo 
in the matrix of Beckett's play. But we can arrive at Godot from multiple perspectives. We can look at Godot from multiple lenses. And I would say that all the lenses are equally valid. All the lenses are equally viable because just like Eliot says in proof law, remember I was talking about proof law a little while ago. When proof law says that the streets lead you to an overwhelming question and then he immediately dismisses it by saying, oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. So let us not ask who is Godo, rather let us discuss, let us come to a discussion on what we individually think about Godo, because that will give us more hints into the being of Godo, rather than any other thing will. All right. So with this, I will end the class today. In the next class, we will discuss certain other issues like Lucky's tirade, like who is the boy, uh, like the setting, etc., etc., etc. We have so many things to discuss. Okay, uh, this entire series will perhaps be uh, four or five class, uh, four or five classes long. Let's see. All right, let's wrap up today. Good night. Thank you so much for attending. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section. I would love to have a discussion with you towards the beginning of the next stream. All right. See you. If everything goes well, maybe we will come back on Wednesday evening around 8-ish to deal with our next class. I'll put up a live stream memorandum. Okay, I'll put up a live stream notification. All right. Good night. Thank you so much.